This morning, this morning I'll be resuming uh, what I began earlier this year in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs 22. When I told uh, Pastor Richard this morning what I would be preaching on, he said, only one verse. So yes, we will only be looking at one verse this morning, verse 3, Proverbs 22, 3. We trust that there'll be some other verses that find their way into the sermon as well. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3. I'm reading from the New International Version. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Earlier in our our married life, my uh, wife and I became aware of a certain tell, a certain giveaway that became very clear to us whenever we went to a restaurant. When we went to a restaurant, we could tell who was an experienced server and who was not. And we could tell because we had a couple little tagalongs with us, three mischievous little boys. And the way that we could tell when we had an experienced server at our table was that an experienced server without fail would always set the table out of reach of the youngest child. As soon as a bumbling rookie waiter came, usually a guy, I don't know how that that happens, but usually a guy, whenever they would come, they would put everything right in reach. And before even the waiter had left the table, disaster, calamity was on the way. We see in this proverb the virtue of prudence. The prudent see danger and take refuge. I believe that this passage will teach us today in very simple terms, four words, watch out or pay up. Watch out or pay up. To give you a little bit of a roadmap of our time together this morning, I'm going to spend some time uh, setting the context which has begotten the words that are in uh, this text. So we'll take some time to view the book of Proverbs as a whole and set this verse in particular in the book as a whole as the book is in the sweep of God's uh, progressive relation, uh, revelation. And then we will take a look at the specific wording of this passage And then we will spend some time in application. So context, wording, application. The book of Proverbs was inspired and compiled during the reign of the Hebrew kings. Now, we typically think of the book of Proverbs as a book that is uh, set within the reign of Solomon. And in fact, that's the way that the book itself uh, starts out. Yet, as we read the details of the book closely, going all the way through the book, we begin to find that it's not only the Proverbs of Solomon. In fact, uh, King Hezekiah's scholars and scribes added some Proverbs of Solomon. Later, uh, added a collection of Proverbs. There are 30 sayings of the wise, there's the sayings of Lemuel and Agur, others within this this book, which actually sets the book historically, the final composition of the book, well within the period of the Hebrew kings. And the reason that that's significant, as I mentioned last time I was able to speak on this 
book, the reason that that's significant is that it reminds us that the, the final copy, the final authoritative copy of this book came about when Solomon's foolishness had already been displayed. So while Solomon writes for us the very words of God, he as an individual in his life shows us the failings of human beings. Though wisest among men, he caved to pressure toward idolatry. His fear of the Lord became perverted and polluted by fear and worship of other gods. This is a common theme throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, throughout our Old Testament, where uh, a perfect and holy and good standard is graciously revealed to God's people by God himself. And yet, they fall short. And, and show that though they receive a lot of good information, there's something wrong on the inside that needs to be transformed. So this book of Proverbs then points us forward to a coming son of David in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and insight, as Colossians 2 verse 3 says. It is only in union with Christ that when we confess our sins and renounce them, Proverbs 28 verse 3, that we find mercy. It is only in him that we have hope of becoming the kind of beautifully wise community that this book portrays. In addition to the placement of this book within the, the canon and the storyline of the scriptures, an important point about the, the context of this book is the context of wisdom itself. That is to say, this verse, the prudent see danger and take refuge, the simple keep going and pay the penalty, is dependent on the fact that Yahweh, the God of the universe, the God of Israel, the true and living God, has made the world dependable, like he is. And that is why it makes sense to be able to see danger and take refuge. The past and the present are a reliable guide to the future. And that, that dictum, that maxim, is actually the very foundation point for a philosophy of science. And all wisdom is based on the fact that what we know and what we see right now is a reliable guide to what we will see. And that point is the foundation stone. Thus, wisdom, human wisdom, is an outgrowth of the fear of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. None of this book of Proverbs presents merely human, secular wisdom. In fact, the Psalms make clear, Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, both make clear that secularism is foolishness in the biblical worldview. worldview. It is the fool who has said in his heart, there is no God. In fact, these Proverbs, which perver uh, preserve for us ancient wisdom, in the places where they most resemble the ancient wisdom of Israel's neighbors, like uh, wisdom that comes out of Egypt, for instance, the places where the parallels are closest are also the places where the name Yahweh occurs in highlighted and repeated form again and again. Thus, when we see a verse like this, it is a distinctly 
It is distinctly owned by believers, by those who fear the Lord. Even if we see unbelievers take advantage of it every single day. It's, it actually belongs to us. A single, all supreme, divine wisdom, capital W, is guiding all things to their intended end. He is faithful day after day after day so that this Bible is not floating away from the pulpit, so that the sun rose this morning, not just on our world, but on countless worlds. And God knows all of those stars by name and never misses one of them, as we heard this morning. Because God is faithful, because God is reliable, there is some predictability in our world. And therefore, it makes sense to be prudent. This proverb is set within the meaty middle of the book of Proverbs, chapters 10 through 22. We see a lot of contrasts, a lot of short, pithy proverbs uh, within this section of the book. And also, this proverb, almost to the letter, is reproduced in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 12. You can take a look at that and follow along as I'm preaching, and it will be basically exactly the same. In fact, to our, with our English translations, you will be able to tell no different. Proverbs 27 uh, verse 12, which suggests something to us, right, about this proverb. It's an important proverb, and it also applies to many different contexts within our own lives. It has a very broad application. In fact, as we turn now to the wording of this proverb, I think you will find that these words are actually quite broad and that the, 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 the Solomonic proverb here is intended for us to be adapted to everyday life. Over the last uh, couple of weeks, I've known that this sermon is approaching, the prudent see danger (laughs) and seek refuge. So I've been thinking about this this moment and and what has been uh, a delight to me, something that actually has been has been something that has brought a smile to my face again and again, is in how many contexts this proverb makes sense. The prudent see danger and take refuge. The simple keep going and pay the penalty. So let's take a a look at the individual words of this text. In Hebrew, there are seven words. We heard uh, Genesis 1.1 also has seven words. Seems like there's a a poetic device there that's actually common. The proverb that I'm looking at next week is also a a seven-word proverb. So we'll take a look at each of these uh, seven words. First, the prudent. This word also is crafty. It's found in other places of the scripture. Now, if I say the word crafty, maybe more crafty than all of the other creatures in the garden, you can think of another use of this word prudent. Now, of course, this verse gives us really the the positive description of what prudence is. In fact, if you take this verse and look at other words, you can use a Strong's Concordance to do this, other times that the word prudent occurs in the book of Proverbs, you'll see that this description fits those other, fits those other texts as well. This is really what it is to be prudent, to see danger, seek refuge, versus being simple and paying the penalty. The prudent have eyes in their head, and those eyes are open. The prudent see danger. They they take the long look. They consider intended and unintended 
consequences. They scan the horizon. They exercise constant vigilance. Back in my childhood, I often uh, remember being stuck watching Tom and Jerry. I don't know if you guys liked Tom and Jerry. Uh, for me, it was usually because nothing else was on. So I was just, I was watching uh, Tom and Jerry. And it seemed about just, just about every half hour of Tom and Jerry, at least one time, you would find Tom chasing that little mouse, Jerry, Tom the cat chasing the little mouse, Jerry. And he's, he's running with everything he's got. He's almost got the mouse, but he's not paying attention to, to where he's going. And he runs right into the djembe, right? Like the bottom of the djembe. And the, and, the, and the top comes up and smacks him in the face. And Jerry is long gone by the time Tom over, overcomes his, his dizziness and frustration. When we see, it's, we are looking where we are going. We are keeping our eyes open. One of the broadest words in this verse is danger. This is the same word that sometimes translated calamity, sometimes translated evil, sometimes translated disaster. It applies to things that come about by human agency and th things over which God superintends for the judgment of people. It's a very broad term, and it opens up all sorts of applications. The prudent see danger. Day in, day out, they're looking ahead. Notice that the, the, that the prudent person is not dominated by fear of danger. Why not? Because he takes refuge. He hides himself. This is the central word. So if you have a seven-word proverb, that means you've got a middle word, right? You've got three on one side and three on another. And the central word of this proverb is refuge to hide oneself, as the English Standard Version has it. Very similar form in Exodus chapter 3. Moses has approached the burning bush. He takes a look at what is this going on, that the, the bush is burning, but it is not consumed. And the Lord speaks to him, and once he realizes what's going on, he seeks to hide himself, same, same word. This, a related word is used in Psalm 42, verse 7. Psalm 42, verse 7 was something of a life verse for a lady that you may have heard of named Cori Ten Boom. Uh, she suffered under the Nazi regime in a concentration camp due to her courageous help lent to the Jewish people who were seeking to escape the Nazi regime. Proverbs 20, or uh, Psalm uh, 42, 7 says, God is our hiding place. And in fact, the, the book uh, that she wrote that recounts the horrors that she faced and how at every step of the way, God was watching her and keeping her and hiding her and being her refuge. Is called, that book is called, The Hiding Place. Not talking about where they hid the Jews, a genius place under the kitchen table, but where they themselves were hiding in the true and living God. The prudent see danger, uh, see danger and take refuge. And for the Christian, for the believer, there is no greater hiding place than our God. He is our shelter in the stormy blast. 
and our home for ages and ages to come. But what's the contrast? On one side, you have watch out. The other side, or pay up. The simple, keep going and pay the penalty. Simple refers to naivete. The simple believe everything. Proverbs 14, verse 5. But the prudent give thought to their steps. Proverbs 7 points to the danger of the adulterous woman. And it's a simple youth who thinks he's just fine wandering around at night, who thinks he's okay listening to the speech of this lady, who is led along like a lamb to the slaughter. That is a picture of the simple-minded man. He keeps going and pays the penalty. The word keeps going usually refers to crossing over, often crossing over a boundary. And in this context, clearly points to some sort of transgression. Trespassers will be prosecuted. Or if you come from Texas like me, trespassers will be shot. And then prosecuted. The simple keep going. Cross over the line and pay the penalty. They come to grief. They suffer loss. In the law, this was the assignment of a fine. For instance, a thief, in his simple-mindedness, thought he was going to get away with it. But the the law charges him not only to restore what he had stolen, but also to pay an additional penalty. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going, pay the penalty. Watch out or pay up. Now this proverb pushes us in many directions. I mean, This kind of wisdom is reflected when you uh, consult uh, Matri route on Twitter before you you head out for the day to consider which route may be the best to get you from point A to point B. This proverb is at work when the doctor advises you. It's time to eat better and exercise more. It's the proverb that's at work really in just about every single sermon that you have ever heard. There's a warning given. Even if the sermon is an entirely instructive, positive sermon, and we're going to get to some proverbs uh, in a moment by way of application that will be largely positive, but on the flip side of the positive is a danger, right? Right? If you you don't get this, that means you lose it. And that's paying a penalty. So this is found in all of life. Whether you're crossing the road or moving your juice cup away from the edge of the table, please, it's a fatherly exhortation to children. School life, working ahead. Working ahead enables you to be free, to be a help to other people. It allows you to avoid the stressful cramming period right before the exam. Because the applications are so varied, I was just, you know, paralyzed by the number of ways that we could apply this text, I I was just looking for some 
some rubric to use to guide applications. And I was, as I was reading the rest of this chapter, I realized that we could actually use the rest of this chapter, or at least a few more verses, as a guide in ways that we can think of categories where this proverb can be applied. Watch out or pay up. Look at verses 4 and 5. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. In the paths of the wicked are snares and pitfalls. And those who would preserve their life stay far from them. The Proverbs call us to honest living, to upright character and behavior, and point to certain wages. There's, there, is tho- there are those who will inherit snares and pitfalls, and those who will inherit riches and honor and life. So these verses call us to watch out, to think ahead, to find the place where we are stepping, and to consider the consequences of our moral actions. On this moral point, we can also consider our life as a congregation. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6, a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough. So he's, he's painting a picture there of a danger. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is a, a chapter that deals with church discipline, specifically a church discipline uh, situation where there's flag, flagrant, unrepentant sin that even the outsiders look at as scandalous. And Paul calls the believers there to put the leaven out. You have been made a new lump of dough in Christ. So it makes no sense for you to retain the old leaven. Remove the yeast from your midst, Paul says. He warns us of a danger, of a moral danger within the congregation and points us to refuge, specific action points that the church can take in its faithfulness. Verse 6, family life. Again, I'm reading from the NIV. Start children off on the way that they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Remember again that this is a book of Proverbs. It points to general realities and not promises that are true in every case and situation. It is absolutely important to remember that our children are made in the image of God. And from the moment of their birth, they have business to do with God. As parents, one of the most humbling realities is that there's business between my boys, each of them, and the Lord. And I can't effect anything in that sphere. I can't bring anything about. Yeah, while it is, tr- while it is true that there's an individual responsibility between the child and the Lord, there's a role that we are called to play. To see the danger ahead for our children and to raise them in the admonishment and nurture of the Lord, as we heard a couple of weeks ago from the book of Ephesians. We're called to use our authority as their parents, as ambassadors of Christ, 
We provide structure, consistency, safety, civilization for our children. And despite what they may think, it is not for their torture, but for their flourishing. Let us be prayerful for one another that we would each find a role with the children of this congregation and the fatherless among us in providing some of that stability and structure, consistency, and safety, using our authority as adults for the sake of their flourishing. Verse 7. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Interestingly enough, in the AM seminar this morning, we actually, this verse actually came up as a point about which uh, the government is, is evidently uh, debating about the role of national debt. My point is not to comment on that, but nevertheless to point out that this verse reveals a danger, doesn't it? There's a disaster on the way. The disaster is that the borrower would be slave to the lender. So in our own lives, does covetousness drive us to get, 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 get? The advent of easy debt within Kenyan borders has not been in every case, a source of blessing, but has often shown this verse to be absolutely true. Lives dominated by debt. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. So what are you going to do? Well, you you need to watch out. You need to be prudent. Living within your means means sacrifice of what you thought you wanted. It means saving up for the future. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. This, doesn't, this is not a comfortable rebuke that Solomon gives us in Proverbs chapter 6. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provision in summer and gathered its food at harvest. God built the ant. It is prudent by instinct. When there is plenty, it puts away. It sacrifices the comfort of the moment for joy when the food and the plenty is gone. It looks ahead to a disaster and seeks refuge. I know that there are uh, insurance salespeople among us and they may be rejoicing to hear this kind of, of talk that there are disasters coming. And one of the hardest jobs is to convince people to spend money to prepare. Why? Because it means discomfort now. It means sacrifice now. Sometimes it feels like what we're doing is taking the danger now so that we avoid it later. But what we're really doing is we're considering two alternative options saying, I could cut a slice of my income now. That's one alternative option. I don't like it. It's not comfortable. But I would much rather do that than be in a situation where I have nothing. And those around me are brought to the point of desperation because they also have nothing. 
Now, storing up for the future can be certainly a source of pride, which is itself a danger to be avoided, right? But it can also be a kind of love to those you know would be there for you when disaster strikes. You can ease their burden by looking ahead, saving up, buying that insurance policy. Now, that's not for every single one of us. This is wisdom. It is prudence. But it does, I think, by the very complexity of that last application, where it costs us, it costs us to seek refuge. I think that opens up an entire new area to consider. Look with me at John chapter, 20, uh, John chapter 12. John 12. Jesus, as wisdom incarnate throughout the Gospels, shows extraordinary prudence. He's always a step ahead of those who would accuse him. He, is, he seems to always be on, on top of the debates. He is able to escape when it is not yet his hour. And yet, when he finally does come to the hour... Listen to him weighing the options. John chapter 12 and verse 20. In this passage, Jesus both weighs options for himself and teaches us to weigh options. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat down on it as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion, see your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. So we know the context, right? This is the triumphal entry. Jesus is entering Jerusalem, the the. Uh, subtitle, uh, the section title in my Bible says, Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. Turn to verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Before Jesus escaped danger because his hour had not yet come. But now, he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies... It produces many seeds. You see Jesus weighing the options. Which is it going to be? Is the seed going to die and produce many or preserve its life and be useless? Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He's looking at Proverbs 22, 3. He sees danger coming. He is going to undergo this experience of forsakenness. He will suffer the wrath of God in, face, uh, in place of sinners. Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, 
glorify your name. As we celebrate Christmas this time of year, this is a reminder that the purpose of the coming was not the stable. Jesus had an hour that he came for. And for him, there were two dangers. There's the danger of facing the wrath of God for sinners. And another danger, the danger of having come for nothing, the danger of his father not being glorified for the mission that the son was sent on. Father, glorify your name, he says in verse 28. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Thus is the promise of the Father. Jesus looked at two choices, a meaningless Christmas, a useless incarnation, and an unhonored Father and an unredeemed people. In love, he came not merely to be born in a stable in Bethlehem, but he paid the penalty to become our refuge. He suffered the price to become our hiding place. As we read in Isaiah 53 earlier, we, every one of us, we were going our own way as little, simple sheep. As we often sing in this congregation, we, we were going our own way in a, in a hell-bound race, indifferent to the cost. We're about to pay the penalty, and we are crossing over. We are running away from the refuge. And yet Christ came, came for us. He suffered in my place. He became my hiding place. Zephaniah chapter 2 pictures the wrath of God being poured out upon the world and exhorts God's people to seek refuge in him, saying, perhaps you may be hidden. And for us who have sought refuge in Christ, don't stray from that refuge. Don't think that there is any way that you yourself could or even should try to pay the penalty. Don't seek your assurance through self-punishment. That's not the way of prudence. The prudent see danger and take refuge. The refuge that we have in Christ our God is fully sufficient both to pay for our sins and rescue us from ourselves. There's nothing else we need. Stand firm in this refuge. And warn your friends. Warn your loved ones. 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 11 talks about the fear of the Lord. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. We have been called as ambassadors of Christ if we are in Christ. And just as we ourselves daily seek refuge in Christ, daily seek forgiveness in him, daily find joy, knowing his spirit is working in us to transform us. Just as we find that refuge in Christ, it's our commission to warn others, to persuade men, be reconciled to God. 
We could continue on. Many other applications of this passage. But let me encourage you to take the long look. What is the trajectory that your life is on? What are the dangers that you are facing? The Lord Jesus, when he was on the earth, Matthew chapter 5 points to a great danger. Let me turn there so I don't misquote it. Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says in verse 27, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who, who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown in hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. There's really no place in Scripture where I could land where we wouldn't find warnings such as this. Are we going to heed a warning like this? Is it, do we have eyes in our heads? Are they open to the dangers that are ahead of us? Will we give ourselves to our refuge, to God, to Christ, our hiding place, and put our hope, faith, contentment, boast in him? Let's pray that the Lord will help us do that. Lord, I pray that you would grant us as a congregation wisdom to see in front of us and to take refuge. Most of all, to take refuge in Christ, our hiding place. I pray, Lord, that you would Grant us grace to rejoice as we see one another growing in wisdom, in tossing off the shackles of simple-mindedness and finding the freedom of prudence. Lord, we look forward to that day for your glory, and in Christ's name we pray for it. Amen.